Issues and Answers, the Mountain Edition, is brought to you by WYMT-TV, East Kentucky Leadership Foundation, and Citizens National Bank and Trust, Hazard. Welcome to Issues and Answers, the Mountain Edition. I'm Tony Turner. We are coming to you tonight on location from the Wendell Ford Airport, and we are joined by former U.S. Senator Wendell Ford and Hazard Mayor Bill Gorman. Senator, Senator it's glad to be you. here. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you for having me. <laughs> Big guy. <laughs> <laughs> These folks, I'll shake your hand too, Mayor. These folks, uh, you guys have gone a long way back in a friendship, and it, it appears while I was talking to you before the program, you guys met, what, during JC's? Uh, back in the early 50s, mid 50s, we've had some awful good times. They had a great JC chapter here, and uh, they kept asking me to come back, and I liked it so much, I'd come every time they invited me. I think I set some kind of a record here for Civic Night or something. And so, but it's, uh, it's been... It's been a, a, a joy and a challenge to work with Bill Gorman. Well, it's kind of ironic you guys are friends, but Bill, you're a Republican. and uh, I, He here. never asked me what my party was or my religion. I've never asked him. We've been good friends. And when it's a project for Hazard, he, he works with me. He works with the other party. And so whatever it takes, Bill Gorman has been trying to do it for Hazard. And you can't fault a fellow when he does that. We are here today because of the dedication of a new uh, runway that we're seeing. Tell me a little bit about what this is going to mean for the area. Well, the, the beautiful thing about this is this fellow here is probably responsible and is responsible for the development of the Wendell H. Ford Regional Airport. And we have a 5,000 foot runway here that Wendell got for us and through his efforts we were able to get the building through the state and through the uh, FAA, and uh, of course we got to, uh, after we got that, we were about three or four hundred, five hundred feet from the runway out there, and uh, we t we talked to Hal Rogers' people, and they helped us get the tarmac. Uh, yeah, so, I, Hal, Hal, Hal's in a position now that uh, I, I, but in the house on the house side, I was on the Senate side. He's in charge of aviation, and uh, so. Maybe not all is lost, because one of the things I want is that extra 2,000 feet on the end of that runway. What would that mean for, for the region? Uh, it would mean that you could land your jets in here, your 747s could land here. You could find uh, other uh, uh, sources of income, new businesses that might come in, you know, uh, FedEx, uh, uh, UPS, those uh, two would look here favorably. They've got the small operation here now and they could enlarge that and make it a regional, just a lot of things. One of the things I found uh, when I was governor that people who wanted to come to this state or any state with a uh, look at it, uh, the prospect of bringing a new industry, they didn't want to fly into Lexington or Louisville and then drive two hours or three hours to the site. They wanted to fly in, get out, go look at the site, listen to the local people, get back on their airplane and go on about their business. And so one of the attractions that we started here was that basically small communities are beginning to have anywhere from 35 to 5,000 5, foot runways. Here, this open up, opens up Appalachia. When you begin to look at what is happening here, you fly over lush green hills and here's a star sitting right here and people know it's here and people understand it and new industry will come because we have the runway out there and greater industry will come if we can get to 2,000 or 2,500 extra feet. Well, I've got to add one thing that <clears throat> what the senator said. Uh, we talked about doing it <laughs> during our stay in office. And of course, <clears throat> Wendell decided he won't take up fishing, so he <laughs> sort of quit. But <clears throat> our goal was to get this and invite the presidential candidates into this airport uh, before this last presidential election. And that was our, our plan and our goal. Well, we didn't get the airport, we, we, but we did get Bill Clinton down here. Uh, when well, it, and, and, and you told him, he, he talked about the airport a little bit too. Didn't he? <laughs> well, he never misses a chance. <laughs> he never misses a chance. Well, yeah, I learned that from you, sir. Well, 
let's talk a little bit about, uh, you and I spoke before we began this program, Senator, about the changes in eastern Kentucky. Uh, and you spoke about the, the, the years when you would come into the area and you would not see the, the, even uh, some of the fast food restaurants that, we, that we've seen here. Tell me a little bit about your experience looking kind of uh, in retrospect compared to, to now. Well, when I look back, I think one of the great things here was the Citadel. Right. That you could uh, go up there and spend the night and get up and see the blue sky and look down at the clouds. It, it, it was an attraction. Uh, <laughs> Then we got a Holiday Inn, you know, right. things begin, and then your hospital, and then your college, and things begin to move, and it's not just Main Street was the only street in town when I first started coming here 40 years ago, but uh, the changes, I wish I had a picture of my first visit to Hazard, and then the picture that we have today. We still have our problems, we still have uh, a lot to do, and I don't think it will ever end. But there's so much to offer here, and the improvement is coming slowly but surely. The slow part of it is the downside. The surely is the good side. So I think that uh, if you look back and uh, the days that we uh, had awful hard time uh, making ends meet and getting enough money to go to Louisville to, to do a little shopping for shoes for kids for the school year, you know, it, uh, it, it has its meaning. But the point that people miss sometimes is the dedication of the people of this area. It's hard to get them to leave. They like it here. It will get better. And they stay and they work and things begin to inch forward. Now I think with uh, the new uh, uh, generating facility you're having here. Coal power. Coal power. And then you begin to look at new industry coming in here, wood. Things are beginning to move in the right direction, and I think they're, instead of being small steps, I think they're going to be kind of, kind of giant leaps. The next one will be bigger, and then the next one bigger than that. So the tenacity of people like Bill Gorman and others up here has uh, paid off, and uh, we've uh, seen it uh, pay off in our lifetime, which is great. I always like heard this saying, if you want to go to church and hear the music, leave him alone. <laughs> Well, what we've done here is that we're able to see what's happened in our lifetime, and I think it's a blessing for us to feel that we did a little something to improve the life of, the, of our state in this area. You have, uh, you talked about the coal power generating plant. Let's talk about clean coal technology. Uh, the Bush administration has said billions of dollars, next 10 years, toward clean coal technology research. You have said, Hey, we were already there at one time. Yeah. Well, if you go back to uh, when I, in 1972, and we put up $50 million at that time for the study and research and clean coal technology, we have probably as good, if not the best, research center at uh, Spindletop, which is associated and connected to the University of Kentucky, on, clean, on, on gasification, liquefaction of coal, and other sources of energy uh, developed from coal. And uh, we had the oil crisis, if you recall, back in the mid-70s, uh, which helped coal. It brought in a lot of money to this area. But those with a pickup truck and a pick and a shovel, when it went down, they left and left those that were here full-time in trouble. And so we had to do a lot of work. But Carter was, the President Carter, was an individual who wanted to do something to reduce our dependency on foreign sources of energy. And so he started developing clean coal technologies and new sources of energy. And when uh, he left office, there was $18 billion, as I recall, in the trust fund to be used for clean coal technologies. We had Ashland Oil that had the H process in, in, in Ashland that would get more than 100% from a barrel of oil. I never understood that, but once they got the gasoline production, the residue was used for lubricants. Mm -hmm. And so they were getting more from a barrel of oil from coal than they were from a regular barrel of oil pumped out of the ground. They wanted to build a uh, plant that cost $5 billion, 35,000 tons of coal per day, 50,000 barrels of oil per day, but the administration of, under Ronald Reagan, I'll lay it out, uh, said no it, it, as far as expansion. It was new uh, construction. It was, it was never been done before. 
and National Oil couldn't carry the load if there was an override, and the government wouldn't share in that override. And so uh, we gradually lost out to the senator from Oklahoma, Henry Bellman, and others uh, for the oil industry and the natural gas industry. If you go back to that period in Canada, we had the, co uh, the tar sands. That was deriving oil, which was heavy oil, from tar sands. They'd separate the oil from the sand. Canada went ahead and built their plant for $2 billion. Today it would cost 12 to 15 to build. They tell me that uh, up to 30% of the oil used in Canada comes from that one plant, the tar sands plant, which we turned our back on and we have a lot of it here. And so uh, we look back uh, on the, in the past and we're getting ready to go through that again. There's some people out here with scars on their back trying to do what was the best interest of, of Kentucky and particularly Appalachia where the coal, where you found the coal that to better talk to them and be sure that this is just not uh, mouth. Uh, I've always heard, put your money where your mouth is. Well, there's a lot of talk about clean coal technologies, but I haven't seen any money that's been put in the budget in order to help uh, research and development to find new technologies as it relates to the coal industry. Is there an amen on that, Mayor? Or well, I, I'm sitting here listening to Senator uh, back when I was a little bit younger, and he was governor of Kentucky. Uh, I was put on the first environmental quality commission that the governor set yeah, up. That's right. And uh, he, so he's always been interested in the environment. And I was vice chairman of that board for about 13 and a half years under four governors. And yeah. uh, I got you into it and you couldn't get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoyed it because we, we did a lot of things then to start the cleaning up of Kentucky. And, and it's it's happening and it's it's good. And, but the only thing is this, the uh, what you said about uh, the coal and the interesting part is that your, your friend Bruce Stevens, same age, born on the same day you were. Businessman in Perry County. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. He, he and Wendell and all of us were old friends, the JCs. But uh, he was uh, with the Kentucky River Coal Corporation. And we talked at length, not 50 years ago, about what we need to do is send coal by wire. And uh, now the nice thing about Enviro Power, this is finally beginning to happen. But this is the first really uh, environmental governor Kentucky ever had. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. But he's absolutely right. This, they call it wheeling. Mm -hmm. And you, you wheel electricity. And uh, it goes uh, through grids. And so you have elect electricity come out here. It may not ever be used in Kentucky. Or it may be used in Paducah. It, it just depends on where you wheel it. And the deregulation of retail uh, will soon come. And one of the things you have to understand is Kentucky has the lowest electrical rate in the country, the lowest. And so these other states where the prices are high and we deregulate retail, then you're going to see people wanting to buy our electricity to take to wheel it to their area. We have to be careful that because we have all these orders for our electricity that we don't overdo it and get into environmental problems. We have to be very careful about that. So you agree with Patton's moratorium on the power plants? For, for the moment, mm -hmm. for the moment. I think you have to look at uh, these LPPs that they have, the, the 250 megawatts. Most of them are gas fire, but they are for peak time. They're there for uh, surplus. And so you have to look at, that, at the mix. But we have the mix right here of whatever is needed, the water, the coal, the, the, the uh, natural gas, the, whatever you need is right here, and you don't have to go any further. And this bill says, send the coal out of East Kentucky by wire, and uh, you'll find that the employee in employment will will soar, and the safety will be uh, good. And so all factors are are lean here. If you just get people to say, well, we're going to have to do this, we're sixty percent dependent on oil from foreign sources. We just got to, we have to reduce that to about 30 percent. Looking, uh, they all, the old saying hindsight 2020, but looking back, could you have predicted the energy crisis that we saw in California? No, I don't think so, because you have to go back and, and uh, uh, Governor Wilson 
put the moratorium on it, then he was going to get everybody to conserve. Mm -hmm. And at, at some point when you get to that, that period, then you don't have to build anymore because of the environment. Well, California is growing so fast, it's the sixth largest uh, budget uh, in the world. Think about that, sixth largest budget for California is the sixth largest in the world. And they're growing by leaps and bounds. And they didn't have the energy to in California or that was coming into California that would accommodate the growth. And so the growth pattern was never anticipated or was never factored in. And I think that's a big problem. Then when you get short and you need something, the price goes up. And so uh, uh, the governor of California is absolutely right. They've been gouged and uh, gouged pretty severely. Let's talk politics. Uh, we haven't talking politics. Let's, let's talk fun politics. Oh, we don't talk I, politics. I, I, I guess. You, uh, tell me what you're doing now. What, what, for those Wendell Ford fans, what's Wendell Ford's life like? Well, right my now? life now is uh, I'm, uh, I don't miss Washington when the fish bite. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm spending about three days a month uh, in Washington with a law firm. I'm not lobbying. I'm uh, uh, advising on energy and aviation and tobacco. And uh, I get uh, some uh, uh, income supplement from that. I'm at the University of Kentucky at the Martin School of uh, Government Administration and Policy. And I teach there about three days a month and, uh, from September through uh, uh, April. And so I have uh, that opportunity to, they asked me what I did at the university and I said the professors teach theory and I teach reality. <laughs> and then uh, I have a little uh, uh, Wendell H. Ford Education Center, we call it. It's trying to get uh, juniors and seniors and others uh, interested in government, in the issues, uh, maybe in politics. But we walk them through uh, uh, life in politics, which is mine. And we try, it. I'm a little bit embarrassed by it, but it proves that the boy from Yellow Creek can make it and can make some changes. And so uh, we have that. Then we have a uh, uh, computer connected uh, to all our congressmen and our senators' offices. And the students can sit down and talk to their congressman or talk to their senator. And we find we have C-SPAN on. And I explain to them what's going on on the Senate floor or what's going on in the hearings and that sort of thing, trying to give them a feel of it. And then we have what we call brown bag lunch. And that's for the uh, older people in town at, at noon of the day we bring a speaker in. We have the students at night after school. And then at noon we have, uh, uh, we had uh, Crit Llewellyn in, just to give you an example, uh, our last time. And he told the kids how important it is to have a home and how important it is for family, how important it is for stability. And he had a good story for them in order, why I have a home, you know, why I have a house. A house is a home. And then the next day, we had the realtors in and the bankers and so forth, and he talked to them about the new changes in the law and things that are necessary, where the money might be, what the interest might be, and that sort of thing. So we had a combination. So I do that at home. You've not and, retired. Then, well, I, well I, I'm not going to wear. I'm, going to, I'm not going to rust out. I may wear out. <laughs> but I, I, I've, been, I've enjoyed it, and it's just like here today. Uh, it, it's it's good to get out and to bring my old friend Leroy Lamar. He's landed at, down by the river, <laughs> then the updraft coming in there and all that to land on this run, runway out here today has been a change. We can, we can see that too. I remember we were following Bert Combs in here when he was governor. I was in a little twin engine behind him and he had this new highway plane and it had reverse and all that on it, you know. So when they landed, they forgot about the updraft, and when they went up, time they got it down, they had it in rivers. <laughs> and they, they were right at the end, right at the bank down there, and almost went over it. And when Combs came out of there, he was pretty pale. And uh, so I was there, we were landing right behind him, watched it all. So I, that's, that, this, this airport's a godsend compared to where we had to land, I'll tell you that. We, we, we've reminisced a little bit, but let's, uh, both of you uh, have, uh, as we talked about, have a sense, I, I would imagine, of, of duty uh, and giving something back to the community. You talk about your JC's work even before you became into, into politics. You're working with young people right now. You've worked with young people and you constantly do. Do you see a change, though, in our young leadership? And is that because 
Has it become a bad thing to run for office now, do you think? In people's minds and young yeah, people's and, minds? Yeah, and, and, and the bad thing's money. Uh, like a fellow said, if you haven't uh, checked on your family tree, uh, it won't cost you anything, just announce for office. And so they'll go back through all of it, you see. And so it, uh, what, and so it, when you go downtown to talk to uh, the leader of the party, Republican or Democrat, they don't ask these young folks who are married, have a family, got an interest, worried about the future. Uh, they don't ask them how you stand on education, how you stand on taxes, how you stand on this. They say, how much money can you raise? Well, they don't know about how much money they can raise, don't know whether they can raise any or not, unless their daddy left them a whole lot and they're millionaires. You know, well, they got plenty of money, they can run for office. But we're losing so many well-trained, well-directed uh, uh, young people uh, in the political system because of the meanness. The more money you have in politics, the meaner you can be. And we found that mean doesn't necessarily get you to, out to vote against somebody it gets you stay at home. And so your people get out and those who will go out and vote all, all normally will always elect. And so uh, meanness is not just to downgrade an individual, it's to turn you off of politics and you just say, I'm not gonna vote for either one of them. So uh, there is a, a sense, Bill, a little change that uh, when I was in politics, and by the way, I just found my, some of my expense account when I was running for lieutenant governor. And $270 was the most expense in any one week that I had in a driver. That included six days of meals, gasoline, and lodging. 270 bucks for two of us. And we were looking for... I'm buying a radio ad right now. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, I, it might get you one or two some, some, at some small radio right. station. But... It just, people, when people uh, said they were for you, they volunteered. They went out to shopping centers, handed out your card, put on bumper stickers. We looked for an office that had two telephone lines. So we could put two people in there calling people after they closed up and ask them to vote for Wendell Ford or John Smith or Joe uh, J Jones or somebody. And so it, it's not that, but I feel that coming back some now. The money is beginning to turn some folks off. And uh, they feel like, well, let's just, we're, we're running against money, and that's a challenge. And that challenge is always something good in politics. If you're challenged to do something, the people say he can't do it, he doesn't have any money, well, we'll show them. So I'm beginning to feel a little of that, and maybe it'll turn around. Maybe some of our uh, people who are, are the gurus, you know, you pay them $75,000, and then they do all the other work for you, you know. And um, those gurus may be finding out that there's a, this, all this nasty, mean stuff is not like getting out and talking about the issues. We used to fill a courthouse. Yeah. People coming from everywhere. And, and, and you wouldn't have to give them hot dogs and a Coke either sometimes, you know. <laughs> but it's still the same way. <laughs> well, uh, I always followed Wendell. I always, when he was in uh, Hazard, Perry County, and, <clears throat> I would go to all his meetings and sit there and listen to him giving my Republican friends hell, and, and I'd clap. <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't given, it, it was the issue. It's a difference. You see, uh, we don't uh, talk about issues, and what you're saying is we don't talk about issues anymore in a campaign, we talk more personality. That's right, and, and yeah. what, what, how bad you are, you know. Uh, and the sins of the father follow the son, you know. And so I've seen that in the recent election in yeah. Pike County. But uh, you have to be, you have to worry about all these sort of things. And I wish they'd cut the polls off about six months from the general election, you know? So I wouldn't tell you, wouldn't get up and say what you want me to. I get up and tell you what I thought. And then you can make your judgment whether you like me or my opponent. We talk about the issues. And we go to the courthouse, and sure we give other people the devil. Harry Truman said, it's not hell, I'm just telling the truth, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's uh, would you would you ever say, I'm through with, with, with retirement, would you ever come back? Oh, I, I can't. I, one of the things I wanted to do was be governor again. I say that uh, openly and yeah. with that, that being ashamed about it. I thought that having had the experience of being governor 
and the connections I had uh, developed in 18 years in Washington that uh, I might be able to make a contribution bringing those together. We were able when uh, 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 Nixon uh, vetoed uh, the highway construction bill and the Congress overrode it. And they took it to court when he, re when he refused to pay. Uh, he put the call pigeonhole, just wouldn't spend it. Mm -hmm. And the court said that when you, uh, when the Congress overrode it, it automatically was to be spent. It became part of the budget. And so it was part, uh, part and parcel during my administration. And so I was able to take, uh, where you had three sections where you could do it one year and next year, we were able to put A and B together and get C ready. And so I think I knew uh, some of my experience how to put these two together. And I th feel like maybe people say he doesn't know what he's talking about, but I think I know the sections of the state that need help that can produce more for its people and for the economic f welfare and future of this state. And so I, I probably, but there was a, a fellow 100 years old, uh, uh, Robert Reed. Mine was as clear as anything. His body was not quite up to shape. But he said, Wendell, we can find a governor, but we can't find a United States senator like you. And you stay where you are. And he was like my daddy talking to me. And so I decided not to run. I, I had that on mind. But uh, I get a lot of visits. People come around, what do you think? You know, well, I give it to them. You know, it's, uh, they say, well, Wendell, you've been talking pretty straight since you left office. Well, the guy said, uh-uh. He talked like that before <laughs> when he was in office. He talked like that when he was in J.C. <laughs> yes, sir. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We've run out of time, and I, I've really enjoyed this oh. show. Thank you very much. We didn't get into anything tough. Did <laughs> no, we? You're, a good, this, you're a good talk show. This host. has all been fun. All yeah. right. Hey, Wendell, I'll vote for you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> One more time. Mayor, let me shake a hand again before we say goodbye. All right, we'll see you next week on Issues and Answers, the Mouth Edition. Issues and Answers, the Mountain Edition, is brought to you by WYMT-TV, East Kentucky Leadership Foundation, and Citizens National Bank and Trust, Hazard.